you talk to the professor. I don't think there's any problem. Yeah. <laughs> because you need three quarters of your blood where there's zero. Yeah. <laughs> So the first uh, lecture uh, uh, is going to focus on the hardware platform side. And uh, as I go along, I kind of partly want to introduce you to the kind of platforms are there, but also touch upon uh, various um, sort of <coughs> topics which are uh, kind of a bit more uh, foundational in nature associated with the way these platforms are designed. Okay, so uh, embedded hardware platforms. So if we look at a generic embedded system platform, it kind of looks like this. Um, it has some sort of a computing core, uh, and I'm including in that storage, memory, stuff like that, right? So that's your processor and um, uh, flash and RAM and stuff like that. It will have some way of interacting with the physical world, uh, sensors and actuators. Some, um, there's a whole rich milieu of these things out there, so uh, very, <coughs> very, very interesting things. Oftentimes, some way of interacting with humans also, like for example, leg severe has those capacitive things and all. So, um, as we talked about, a lot of these things are human coupled. Um, some way of talking with peripherals, other computers, devices, and all. So, network interfaces, IO interfaces, network interfaces. Ethernet, wireless, uh, you call things out there. IO interfaces could be things like serial buses and all, so variety of options out there. So network interface, uh, Ethernet is very common in a lot of devices, particularly devices which have power over Ethernet. Anyone heard of power over Ethernet? No? Like, like the cat cable, right? Yeah. yeah, so on the other side, you have, have a 48 volt power supply also as part of your Ethernet switch and it sends a 48 volt thing over the wire and then on the board there will be something to kind of extract the power and kind of use it. So particularly webcams and all often have that so that you don't have to have a electrical outlet. Out there. Okay, uh, Wi-Fi obviously we know, uh, Bluetooth. Okay, so often in some of the description we saw it has Bluetooth and BLE, Bluetooth low energy, anyone knows what? What is Bluetooth low energy? Bluetooth versus Bluetooth and BLE. Like Yeah. You, you, 
you, you got it mostly right. Yeah. So original Bluetooth was more like a cable replacement. In fact, that's how it was advertised. So it was a relatively fast cable of around a mega, megabit per second to two megabit per second. Uh, but that's what it is, what it was. And it also had some, it, it had a whole bunch of other features, but no one used them. It was basically like this. And for a variety of reasons, um, the primary way it got used was as a serial cable, serial data over Bluetooth, and with something called serial supply. And it was very power hungry, as you pointed out, because it's always on. It took a lot of effort at the beginning of a session to discover each other and all. So you had this whole pairing mechanism and connection mechanism and stuff like that. So consumed a lot of energy and consumed, uh, had, had this complicated <coughs> setup registration phase. And I guess the biggest killer was that Apple decided to not support it. Or more precisely, Apple decided that for anyone to support it, they needed to buy a particular made for iOS chip or something like that to put into the other side, and that cost an arm and a leg. Okay, so no one, uh, so 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 uh, devices supporting classical Bluetooth didn't emerge for Apple, and I guess they were doing it because of the power reason, because as you know, it's very finicky about that. Okay, so be what it may, so that. Meanwhile, for sports type thing and all, there was a competing standard, something called AND, which was kind of just a proprietary standard that uh, grew out of a company. And that was eating Bluetooth lunch because uh, it began to appear in uh, exercise equipment and stuff like that and all, and sort of companies began to support it. Uh, so then Bluetooth came up with this BLE, which uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, which is was very much modeled after ANT and its characteristic, but the main thing, it did two main, two, two, two things. First thing it did was that uh, uh, you do not have this continuous stream, but it's really optimized for traffic, which is once in a while. Kind of the term which is used is for BLE, it's called duty cycled. That is sleep. Wake up, send something, sleep, wake up, send something. And that works great for a lot of stuff, right? I mean, heart rate sensors, these kind of things, they send out a beep, and in between, they can go back to sleep. Now, that required, and you'll see later in the course, it does require radio designers to do some stuff, like your radio should be very <coughs> rapid to wake up and go back to sleep, and while sleeping, should not consume a lot of power and all, but it did all of that, and really kind of emerged uh, out of that. The other thing it did was, Unlike classical Bluetooth, where you had to do all this complicated pairing, BLE doesn't require it. You could still have connections in BLE, but you can also send information without any explicit pairing. Uh, and the way you do it is you put this information in some sort of an advertisement packet, which these devices just send out. So you'll hear these type of terms like Bluetooth beacons, iBeacon, these tags and all. In fact, download some Bluetooth beaconing app on your phone and just try it out, you will see that you will discover tons of devices around it, okay? So you don't have to go into any sort of explicit mode. You can just set your devices so that in the background, they are listening for what what kind of BLE packets are there and then kind of record them, do some stuff with them. And Apple supported it. Um, and uh, <coughs> so, uh, so, it, so, so these devices kind of caught on. Uh, network interfaces, we also saw A2.15.4. Um, which is the so-called Zigbee. You see that in things like smart lighting, smart meters, these kind of things. Um, they are quite there. And there are a bunch of other things. There's industrial related stuff and all also right there. So uh, on the Bluetooth front, by the way, um, past year, there is also Bluetooth 5, which has emerged. And one of the things that Bluetooth 5 does is, it now allows devices to form what is called as multi-hop network. So, Bluetooth 5, and it has what is called multi-hop. So devices can talk to each other as opposed to a device to a phone kind of thing. Not, not this kind of master slave, but really peer to peer. So you can have multiple hops of network. One light bulb can send a message to another light bulb, another light bulb, the post can have people send multiple bulbs. IO interfaces refer to things which are 
more uh, localized connection to peripherals and also our good old serial connection UART for RS-232, USB and a whole bunch of others. Uh, some which are more power hungry, so obviously stuff like HDMI and for displays and Thunderbolt, uh, which you find in the laptops and all. Um, and then there are many domain specific type IO interfaces also out there. There's something called CAN bus. Anyone heard of CAN bus? Control area network bus. Uh, it's, uh, it's used in cars. And in fact, most cars made in this country, uh, well, all but Tesla since 1997, have uh, something called OBD24, which is kind of a little outlet uh, under your steering wheel. And that hooks up to the network in the car, uh, the CAN bus, and that's uh, on that network are a whole bunch of uh, embedded devices. They're called ECUs, um, and OBD24 allows you to essentially read and write from that CAN bus traffic. So you can buy little boards. You can kind of inject, uh, work with that, and they can hook up to your smartphone pretty easily. Um, so CAN bus. Um, and then there are other specialized things like I2C, which is used by many sensors. There is something called SPY, which is serial peripheral interface, a super simple bus. There is something called one wire bus. There's a whole bunch of them out there, okay? And they kind of cater to different industry segments and things like that. So there's nothing, uh, but you will often find them in a lot of these platforms because they're common. Final piece of the puzzle is very important, which is a power subsystem, which is where does this whole thing get powered up? Now, obviously, the simple thing would be just hook it up to an adapt adapter and feed five volt or 12 volt or something like that to it. But um, uh, oftentimes, these are battery operated devices, uh, in which case uh, you'll have battery. Uh, then also, uh, so, so plugged in is one option, battery and the battery could be replaceable or rechargeable. And then finally, energy harvesting. Energy harvesting refers to the fact that uh, the system just gets energy from the environment. Um, solar cells are an example. Can you think of something else? Other ways in which you can get energy from the environment? Or think of something. Yeah, like when you have like a Prius and brake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also for motion power and motion control. Mm -hmm. uh, motion power, yeah. So when you move around and all, uh, I mean, there are these emergency flashlights and all, right? I mean, which you kind of just um, well, uh, move them around a little bit and you can get charged up. But there are other ways of challenging motion power also. Uh, and other, other things which come to mind, what other phenomenon you can make use of to get energy? Light is nothing but electromagnetic radiation. So other forms of EM radiation, microwaves, lasers, um, RF signals. In fact, some very cool work which has been happening in recent years at uh, the university is that basically they get energy from the Wi-Fi signals and the TV signals which are out there. So these are battery-less systems. Okay, so pretty cool stuff out there. So anyway, uh, in the power system, there will be some sort of a source or harvester. Some way, particularly for harvesting type things when you're storing it, usually some capacitor or rechargeable battery, and then regulator. Anyone knows what regulator is? Voltage regulator. Twelve to five, but it does something more important. Uh, yeah, well, you're right. It does voltage conversion. So, yes, regulators do plus convert voltage levels, okay? But regulation refers to the quality that is you don't want noise to be there in the power supply because that's going to affect everything. So it does these two functions. It takes AC or a different voltage DC and gets you the right voltage and it makes sure that that voltage is high quality and also that the system works properly. Okay. So all of that kind of goes on. What we are going to focus on, at least for now, is this side. Okay, what's going on in the middle? Uh, later on, we will 
get into some of the other pieces, um, or power subsystem not, and human interface is not remote. So when it comes to implementing computation, most of us think of it as writing a program for a processor, but uh, that's not the only way you can realize an algorithm. There are many other ways you could do it. For example, I could create a custom chip. I could put down transistor to just do my algorithm out there. ASIC refers to application specific integrated circuits. FPGA, everyone knows FPGA? Heard of it? Someone not? Anyone doesn't? Okay, so, um, and what happens is that there are bits and pieces of design you can buy, there are open source community for this thing, you can, um, you can get designs and you can upgrade your own designs. And then if you are rich, you can make a custom chip. Uh, if you have a small volume, you know, you go with FPGA. So that's one approach. Creating a custom board, you buy chips, Create your own board. Uh, small, small volume board manufacturing can be done relatively easily nowadays, particularly because we have this really nice global manufacturing chain, right? You send stuff, goes to Shenzhen in China, and a few days later, your board comes back at a super low price. There are companies whose business model and all is entirely kind of based around this. So you can do all of that. You can create a custom system where you just buy boards and put them into some sort of a chassis. So, chip, board, custom chip, custom board, custom chassis, and you are basically buying single board computers and other boards and then putting them in. Usually here, you will use some bus like compact PCI. So this is, and there are companies who are in the business of selling robust chassis and a whole bunch of boards and you configure your own system. And then finally, you just use a standard <laughs> platform. Uh, like a ruggedized PC or ruggedized smartphone or something like that. So all of these options are uh, exist for implementing computation. Uh, I guess most interesting in a way is this site. So uh, because that's where you really get to uh, do things which are very specific uh, there. But these are also all valid valid options with uh, different trade-offs of size and stuff like that. So if we dive deeper into any one of these, and if you think about where is the computation actually taking place, then you have a bunch of options. So there's microprocessor, or good old Intel processors or something like that. But there are a whole bunch of other options also which we often don't think that much about. So there's a whole class of things called domain-specific processors. At UCLA, we have the Center on Domain-Specific Computing. Anyone heard of it? Professor Jason Kong at CS, um, and I guess our two, three other faculty. Uh, what this refers to is these are processors which are optimized for specific application domains. And the ones I have listed out here are very commonly there. Microcontroller, I have put it there because they're mostly used for embedded applications. It's usually the term uh, graphic processing unit, GPU, which exists uh, in our regular computers as well digital signal processor and network processors, and there are other crypto processors, there are a bunch of other things, uh, so we can also add that, crypto processor, and there might be others. Then the next category, application specific instruction processor. This one is pretty cool. Here, you, you get to design a processor with your own custom instruction set. So custom instruction set. So let's say I'm doing an application where I never need part of the instruction set. Then why, why am I paying the silicon and area for it so I can just drop it out? Or maybe I need a special instruction to do something with it and add that. So there are companies which whose business model is that they can create, they give you the tools so that you can create your custom processor like this. It looks and feels like a, um, processor, but it has a custom instruction set, and then they'll also generate the compiler and all for you. So there's a company called Tensilica. If you go to their website, you would see that that's their business model, and there are others. Now, as you can see that 
So more we are going down, there is more kind of customization possibilities. Reconfigurable system on chips. I'll have an example out there, but these are like your um, that chips where they may have a processor, they may have an FPGA, they may have a whole bunch of other things, and you can software define it. Okay, so essentially they, they come closest to this notion of software defined hardware. Feed programmable gator is uh, many of uh, I mean sounds like all of you have uh, some familiarity with it at least. Uh, many of our courses use it, but this is where you get to wire up at the level of gates and transistors. So you can really create uh, custom design, but do it very rapidly because it's again software defined connectivity among gates. And then finally, ASICs, which is, uh, as I talked about earlier, you're sitting down and designing your own custom IC. So you're really hard coding stuff into silicon, but you are doing it just for your own chip. So which one do you think will have highest performance? Hmm? Yes, it. Or all other things being equal, right? I mean, assuming similar silicon technology, right? Um, which one do you think would have the most rapid time to market? Generally, right? I mean, software is a lot easier to roll out than so stuff on the upper side, okay, right? Um, would be easier to do. So you can see that these choice, there are different choices. Uh, so speed wise, uh, yeah, this end is going to be higher. Roughly speaking, they say that for the same thing, uh, by the time you hit here, you get, uh, sorry. How do I, this, okay, not here. Somewhere out here, you have a factor of 10 advantage. And then this gives you another factor of 10. That's kind of a good rule of thumb, okay? Uh, because what you are getting is that uh, lots of parallelism, pipelining, uh, a lot of time our, app, our, our instructions, are, uh, the, the, our, our algorithms are doing relatively simple things, but you have the whole baggage of a microprocessor behind it. You can kind of get rid of that. So you get sort of advantages. Uh, uh, so 10 to the power one, 10 to the power two, perhaps even more. So huge gains can be obtained and that's why like for example you see Bitcoin mining companies, they are operating down there, right? Because there's so much payback that uh, they can afford to do it. Um, processing large amounts of data, um, AI, machine learning, all these kind of things, they often kind of end up in that corner. Power consumption uh, goes up this way, right? Processors um, can be pretty power hungry. How much power do you think the processor in my laptop consumes when running full blast? Uh, this one is more, uh, but yeah, like, I mean, these things can peak 100 watt. Okay, server class stuff can go up to 150, 200 watt, right? Uh, so, huge, uh, so, so microprocessors tend to be in, okay, so obviously you're not going to use those processors in, uh, um, in, in, in embedded systems, but even your low end embedded, uh, sorry, low end Intel processors, anyone knows what they're called? That family? Low atom, atom processors, right? Intel atom, for example. Um, they're in watts, 5, 10, 15 watts. So they are pretty huge. Um, on the other hand, you have huge advantages because of customizability and all at this end, so you can make things down into uh, micro watts and all these kind of things. So if you hang around with people who design chips and all, a very common thing they do is they'll take some algorithm and say, hey, we have reduced power consumption by three, four, five order of magnitude. Cost. So what about cost? Which one do you think would be better cost-wise? ASX. Depends on volume, exactly. So why does it depend on volume? Right. So what he's touching upon is a very important point, which you should keep in mind is that ultimately this whole thing is about economics and uh, the way product design works is, if you look at these things, there is a total product cost, and that really is made up of a fixed component and a recurring component, per par and fixed. So the fixed component, uh, sorry, 
fixed component includes things like the money you spent on designing, design tools, um, sort of uh, test, developing testing, all the stuff which is really you have to do just to get even one chip out. Um, vendor cost, <laughs> making masks, um, which is then used to fabricate the chip, all of those things have to be done. Just the masks alone, which are made, which are used to make a custom chip, can is many millions of dollars. So if you're just making one chip, getting a mask made for it is just out of the question, okay? You can save some on cost by sharing it with others, but you're still looking at, let's say, $100,000, $200,000 just for that one chip. So not, not worthwhile if your volume is very low. And then you have recurrent costs, which are things like the actual cost of the silicon, the processing of it, and so on, or packaging, and things like that. And all of this kind of adds up. So if you look at uh, that, there will be some sort of break-even analysis. So uh, there are kind of three options out here. So I'm going to what they specifically are, which is customized series, FGPA, and this array. But the point that you would see is that uh, fixed cost-wise, custom stuff is very expensive, right? But part cost is very low because it's highly optimized and all. And it's that tension which kind of plays out. So there would be some sort of a break-even point. So at very low volumes, if you see out here, the FPGA solution is very good. But at very high volume in terms of the total cost, FPGA blows up because every FPGA, because it is bloated, is sort of adding to the cost. <coughs> so the cost picture looks something like this, right? Depends upon the volume that you will work with. In all of this, another. <coughs> Another thing to keep in mind, which is the design time, right? It's, that's why I asked the question earlier, like how long will it take for you to design? Because delayed design has a monetary cost also, right? And so if you go in early, perhaps you will capture more of the market. If you are late, you capture less of the market, and that has this cost also. So uh, designing ASICs is hard, uh, designing software is easier, uh, so if you can hit the market earlier, uh, then you're better off. Sometimes what company you might do is that your initial solution may actually be an FPGA or processor or something like that, and while you capture the market, and meanwhile you're making the chip so that version two kind of replaces that. So you combine these things out. So long story short, there are lots of options and lots of <coughs> trade-offs that you have to Consider and of course there are going to be hard constraints also and then there are there are and there are also applications where cost considerations uh, matter far less so NASA or U.S. Army or NSA these kind of players for them the uh, requirements and all of this very different. Sometimes they might just make something one off, but they need the speed. Okay, most common for the kind of embedded system that we are dealing with is the compute form that takes place is the so-called microcontroller units or MCUs or just name microcontroller. So an MCU is basically fair number of subsystems of a standard computer put onto a single chip. So processor for sure, the CPU core. Uh, usually a microprocessor will only have the processor and I guess a unit cache as part of the processor, but not much else. But in case of MCU, you will also have the storage for core, so long, in data memory, and peripherals, all of them kind of built in. So it's kind of a self-contained thing, and in fact, in some cases, it might even have other stuff, but at the very least, it has these things. So like things like memory management unit, memory control, all, all, all of the stuff is kind of part of the same thing. So of course, we are dealing with similar silicon technologies and all. So if I'm putting all this other stuff onto the chip, something has to give. So the CPUs tend to be simpler types of things, OK? Um, yeah, so uh, most, most of the CPUs that are sold are really part of such MCUs, and then what the typical business model is that the chip vendors develop their own CPU core, that's one source. They license them, 
So for example, they license them from ARM, which is the dominant company in this space, or they use open source ones. In recent years, uh, Berkeley uh, has created this thing called Risk Five, which is an open source processor. Really, very cool. You can design your own, take your own, spin out your own silicon, put them in FPGAs, whatnot. Um, uh, great, great thing for sort of startups to uh, yeah, yeah, work with. So the, all, all these three options kind of exist. The thing to note is that in the microprocessor world, most of the microprocessors sold are basically Intel. Okay, and AMD, which is effectively Intel clone, and I think there are a couple of Chinese companies which have. Again, kind of versions of uh, something like this. It, the, the, uh, the state of affairs is much more diverse out here. Um, and in fact, different MPU chips for different application domains. There are a whole bunch of players which exist in the space. Um, so, microprocessor versus microcontroller. So, just to make the distinction clear, then microprocessor is just the control logic, the arithmetic logic unit, the register, the thing that we think of as a CPU. And then usually you may have within this thing maybe cache, maybe some, a few other things, but that's really part of the core CPU. Okay, TL, TLB, MMU, maybe all of that stuff is in there, possibly. Okay. Microcontroller, on the other hand, has everything that is there in the microprocessor, and it will also support ROM, RAM, IO, such kind of services. So that's uh, what it is, and some of the companies that are active in the space, Atmel, TI, ST Microelectronics, and there are a bunch of others, Qualcomm, and, and uh, so this is another view of it, that we are taking a whole bunch of these things, it's usually are scattered over the board, microprocessor, RAM, program memory, and all, you kind of just put it into a single chip, and that's what MCU is. Beyond MCU, there is another category of chips which are called system on chips or programmable system on chips. And what they also do is they also put in things like uh, analog and uh, interfaces so that you can hook up to sensors and all very easily. And also there's a company called Cypress which makes them. Um, I, rough, I kind of put these things as MCU with some additional stuff very broadly in a similar category of thing. They may also have a little bit of FPGA-like stuff. So this, this part is kind of like FPGA so that again you can do some customization. So configurable digital and analog blocks and then the ability to interconnect them there. So they are MCU with FPGA and a little other stuff. Are these the MFK No, uh, Cypress uses 8051 which is the old Intel microcontroller unit uh, uh, but but there are other companies which kind of make these things. This is this is a bit more of a boutique corner of design space, so you will not encounter it that easily unless sort of you go around looking for it. So, yeah. what, what exactly differentiates these from the other ones? Um, because our normal microcontroller units do have these ADC. No, but they do not have an FPGA on it. They do not have analog array on it. So normal, uh, they may have an ADC on it but they will not have like amplifiers and the ability to wire them up in any whichever way you want. So it's this configurable blocks. You can put a amp there and you can configure its gain and stuff like that. Again, standard MCU that provides these things. So they are taking even more of the stuff which goes onto a printed circuit board and putting them onto a system back. So you find them in like Sonic Air toothbrush, for example, if you have that electric toothbrush from Philips, uh, iPod, or it, uh, I think they make something made now, but uh, they were extensive users of it, and uh, a bunch of products out there, um, cars, the touch surfaces, and all use them. So MCUs have immense diversity, unlike processors, where unlike micro Intel microprocessors compared to that. So firstly, a uh, number of bits. Uh, uh, I would add 64 also out here. There are 64-bit MCUs as well in update at the high end, Snapdragon and Qualcomm. Um, instruction sets, there is a fair bit of diversity. And memory architecture. So there are Princeton architecture and Harvard architecture. Anyone heard of them? What they mean? So in a standard computer, data and program they both reside 
in the same address space, same memory. And that idea was given by who? Von Neumann, right? He was at Princeton, so that's why I called Princeton architecture. Single memory space. I don't know who at Harvard, but Harvard architecture refers to that data memory and program memory are two separate things, two separate buckets. Okay, the advantage is higher performance. So this one is same program plus data, separate program and data. Okay. So Harvard is often found in single processors where you are for the same technology, you want kind of more performance out of it. So you see in many, many microcontrollers, right? whether it's a microprocessor, I don't know, any microprocessor. Risk versus risk. Anyone knows what that is? In fact, those of you who are in computer science, this year's Turing Award winner was for In fact, you know, this year's one of the two Turing Award winners is a UCL graduate. No? No idea? Okay. Yes. Absolutely. And complex. Okay. Excellent. So, so computers used to be CISC because there was this mindset that I should have features for instructions. So each instruction would do a lot of stuff, or you take, and most of the time you were not using any of that. So back in mid eighties, early eighties. Um, Dave Patterson at Berkeley and John Macy at Stanford, these two guys kind of said, you know, why carry all this baggage? Let's keep the hardware simple and let the compiler handle uh, these needs. So, of course, compilation technology has advanced quite significantly and also they went for these super simple processors where each instruction did very simple stuff, uh, just move data from register to register, register thing, not, and they were all designed to just do it things in like single clock cycles as much as possible. Uh, whereas CISC, Intel processor all the time, they were basically, some instructions could take tens and hundreds of cycles, okay, all sort of complexity would arise. So this basically kind of ended up uh, why processors became so energy efficient. ARM processor, which you find in your iOS phone and Android phones and all, they are, they are great examples of it. On the main PC side though, Intel still kind of hung on to CISC uh, because Intel had a huge advantage of semiconductor technology. Some of it has begun to change. Just yesterday there was this news that Apple may be switching to ARM processor even for the laptops by year 2020. So I think I think at some stage uh, sort of the efficiency catches up. In any case, um, these two gentlemen got this year's Turing Award and Dave Patterson is a UCLA graduate. So this sort of interesting to think about. Okay, a um, whole bunch of families, uh, as in, so AT51 is something that Intel had made in early 70s. But Motorola, which is a company which is now dead and part of Google, I think, so um, microchip, Texas Instruments, uh, National System Center, ARM, which I keep mentioning because they dominate. So, um, so ARM is a dominant company. And then within each one of these families, Many companies make this thing. So like ARM does not make its own chips. ARM just sells its design and whole bunch of companies make it, some for private use and some for selling it to others. So like for example, Apple uses it for private use. You can't buy Apple's processors. They made, uh, they use ARM uh, architecture, but it's just internal use for Apple. Uh, on the other hand, like Qualcomm sells Snapdragon. You can buy the processor. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of other companies which make uh, other things. So, so that's uh, uh, that's the processor example. Just to kind of give you an example, ST Microelectronics is one company. Uh, it's, uh, it's a European company, and you would see that they make a whole bunch of MPUs, 8-bit, 32-bit, consistent 32-bit architecture, 
and then those optimized those which are wireless, the century but it says ultra low power and mainstream and high performance. So they have all these different categories, a whole bunch of chips that they make. And uh, you go further, they have a whole bunch of different performance thing, and you go further on their website and then there are a table which actually just they have like close to hundred options and kind of all sort of different things. This is not like this is not how Intel operates. You go to Intel website, you have a few choices. Um, here, every manual thing, if you read down these things, like size of flash memory, 16, 128, 192, how many RAM you have, 2, 20, uh, 8, all sort of options. So the idea is that basically, uh, they, this market is so large that they're able to create all these specialized versions, and then you buy the one which is just has the right amount of features that you need so that you're not paying for unnecessary silicon and not and you're not paying for unnecessary power. Both of them are important in this market because every microwatt matters and frankly in this market every cent matters. These chips sell for pennies, dollars. This is a very different market than Intel. Intel sells a chip for hundreds of dollars. These chips are sold large volumes, but cents and single dollar, maybe $10 minutes, okay, so in that sense. So very, very different dynamics there, and you see kind of this playing out. And ST is by no means like this. You go to Texas Instruments or Atmel or any one of these things, you'll see the same thing. Gazillion choices of processors, and you can just pick the right one uh, just for your need. So as you go around selecting these things, the metric that matter, performance, you can get stuff which is literally in kilohertz range to gigahertz range. Uh, power, microwatts to watts. Program memory, kilobytes to megabytes. Data memory, and in some cases just bytes. Um, I.O., uh, that matters a lot because how many pins do you have on the chip? Peripherals, what kind of peripherals that, that you need? Internal functions, you have DNA. Anyone knows what DNA is? What does it do? Okay, these two guys. <laughs> have you program anyone programmed using DMA ever? No one. Okay. Um, unfortunately, our processor doesn't have DMA, so otherwise I would have loved to. But DMA, think of DMA as like a specialized little processor sitting in your corner of your chip, and its task is to move stuff from memory to memory. It doesn't do anything else, but it can do it in parallel with running your program. So if you have sensor data coming in and it's sitting in some buffer, you can task this DNA to move it into your main memory and then send you an instruct when it is ready so that your main processor can keep doing its computation. So DMA is direct memory access. Cache, memory protection, secure enclaves. Uh, now, since we talked earlier about security being an issue, Nowadays, many of these processors have uh, features so that uh, no one can tamper with the software, so that they know that the software is coming from the right place, so that, uh, so all sort of security stuff. And then also matters are things like cost, obviously, but what kind of software tools. You may have a cheap processor, but if the compiler is awful, then no point using it. What kind of support exists for things like debugging and also all those kind of things matter quite a bit in terms of your choices. So if you look at an example MCU-based platform, it kind of looks like the following. I mean, like any other computer at some level, but based around these MCUs, right? I mean, so you will have kind of an underlying platform. The operating systems tend to be very different because they're optimized for real-time limits, small footprint, um, the usual functions that you need to support applications with, and then the drivers for various kind of uh, IO so the one we will be using is called Embed OS, uh, which is what we will be using. It's not a very hard real-time system, but it's one which is uh, pretty pretty capable and it's formally supported by ARM, so it's being well developed and all. So I'm going to stop at this stage. We're going to pick this thing up on Thursday, and uh, after this, we'll move to software organization. Yes, so very important, uh, just, just, just wanted to sort of re-emphasize it again and again. This is not a course to take if you plan to skip the discussion sections because we'll be very fluidly 
moving back and forth between description and lecture. Uh, if you look at the schedule I have put, in many cases, I'm going to be lecturing on Friday, and we'll then have a coalesced two-hour discussion section because certain things, the TA just needs more time. So we're gonna go sort of back and forth like that. So unfortunately, if you have like an overlap issue where some other class collides with your Friday discussion section, just make a choice, one course or the other. You can't, you can't do this course without it, okay? So just, just wanted to make sure that uh, you kind of realize it. This Friday, irrespective of what the TA does or doesn't, I'm, because his baby came out three or four weeks premature, so it's a bit of a surprise for us. But uh, uh, so I will, I will cover it in case he's. Yeah. 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 Y